Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. My pleasure to, to welcome uh, James George, who is, I, I was tempted to introduce him as computer scientist turned artist, but I suspect he was artist way before he was a computer scientist. <laughs> um, so he's an artist who happened to have gotten his degree in computer science, I suspect well put, is what yeah. happened. <laughs> um, his art pieces, his installations, films, his mobile applications have been exhibited around the world, um, and I think he's going to show us some of that today. Um, James is currently an um, artist in residence at the iBeam um, Art and Technology Center. Um, he's also a fellow at the CMU Studio for Creative Inquiry, um, as well as a faculty member um, at NYU. Um, so yeah. take it away, James. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Desi. Um, so the title of my talk and the plan was to talk about computational artists through a virtual lens. And I think that will clarify itself quickly. But then after all meeting you yesterday, uh, I figured I might throw in a little more personal data. So the second title for this talk has become a computational artist with a virtual camera. So it's these two things together. And this is going to get pretty meta, so be careful. Um, so my name is James George. I have a Twitter and a website, which I encourage you to contact me through. Um, and I have a hobby of playing with cameras in strange ways. And this is one of my uh, favorite pastimes. I'm about to set the free fall high score. Here it comes. <laughs> so this was uh, the first test of an application that I developed that was called Freefall High Score. And the, the, con <laughs> the concept of this application was who can drop their phone, or rather suspend their phone in freefall for as long as possible. Using the phone's accelerometer, I could detect the mo minute, minute it, it left the Earth's gravitational force, or rather joined with it, and start, start a timer as well as recording video. Those videos would then, you could tell the story and how long that you had, they had fallen, and, tell us, and that would upload to YouTube where it was secretly tagged with that data and then aggregated onto a website ranking the highest score, the highest score drops um, in this kind of a, a high score page. So the, the concept here is to you know, take something that we value more than we should, that maybe we don't even realize the amount that, of, of, that we've attached that we've become attached to these devices. And then take an application through that language, the logic of writing applications, and call into question that attachment. And put someone in an uncomfortable situation, but still you know, ticking the box of competition and play and creativity. And maybe instead of looking at your phone, look at the, the high buildings around you in New York City and think about, how can I use that building to break this high score? So um, I was really excited about this application. You know, fervently developed it, submitted it to the App Store, and ret was returned with this. <laughs> and I mean, so Apple said in their policy uh, that they wanted people to make innovative applications that make people think about their lives in new ways. I thought I was doing that, but they uh, had a different opinion. So the application is available on Android, um, not as cleanly implemented as Apple. So, but that's that's how it goes. Um, but I thought that. Uh, to make up for this, I would do an event, like an installation, like how am I going to get this out into the world? How am I going to find people to set the high score? So I started a contest. And the contest was modeled after, um, in high school, you have an egg drop contest, where it's you know, to teach kids physics, how do you protect an egg? Well, I was going to do the same thing, except I would give people phones, and they could keep the phones if they could find a way to drop them off a building and set a high score. And I'd like to show you the winner of that competition. Hi, my name is Tim. Uh, this is my preserver. It's the iPod. Uh, there's a little hole in the bottom for the, the camera to peek out of, and uh, some daisies on top. Yeah. So the phone obviously survived, <laughs> and he won the high scores, 2.7 seconds. Um, and actually, someone in Finland recently broke the high score, but they were disqualified because they put 
the phone inside of a container so you couldn't see the video. So one of the requirements for the preserver was that you couldn't obscure the camera's lens. So you had to have proof of the, of the phone falling. So that was an individual project. Um, but I also work on a lot of collaborative things. And this is where this awkward position of being a computer scientist and an artist comes into play is that oftentimes I'll work with other artists to uh, realize their ideas or merge my skills with, the, with them to create larger scale installations and things of greater context. So I'm going to show two collaborations which I think will resonate with people in this lab. Um, the first is called Sniff. Maybe we get the lights down for just a second. Sorry, I sprang that on you. So Sniff, Sniff is an interactive dog made for street projection and he, he tries to, to understand what you think of him. And in doing that, he tries to make sure that you are trying to think, what does this person think of me? So it's a way of instilling agency in a virtual creature injected into public space in a way that makes you question your environment. And people that aren't expecting to encounter art will encounter an artful experience and uh, you know, wonder who, who put this there? Who, why is this here? Why is this dog looking at me? And then slowly start to understand through the power of gaze and interaction that yes, this, this, uh, this creature, this virtual dog, is indeed guessing what I'm trying to do. If you run at it quickly, it'll jump back. If you hold out your hand, it will um, wag its tail and sit down. If you move suddenly, it will uh, bark at you. If there's multiple people, it'll choose the most interesting person based on their, their gestures. And you know, different, a group of people will vie for the attention of the dog. And the idea is, even though we know something is virtual, if you, if you instill something with animated qualities of a character, we can suspend disbelief and, and start to really imagine what does this creature think of me. Um, and this has been exhibited uh, several times. This was the first installation on a Brooklyn street corner. Um, and just because I'm the tech guy, I'd like to show you the behind the scenes of how this works. And this is, begins to get you know, at some of the conversations that we were having yesterday. So this is Unity 3D rendering the dog, which is choosing hundreds of small animation clips that are less than a second long trying to decide which one is best based on the dog's desire, where it wants to stand, what, it want, what expression or emotion it wants to, to express. At the same time, there's a vision system that's feeding it information about who's standing in front of it. And these applications were never meant to communicate with each other necessarily, but they work over a network protocol called OSC, and we design these, these little communication systems to, to make experiences that are more powerful than either of these applications could um, achieve by themselves. So that project led to another collaboration with um, a renowned video, uh, music video director and experimental artist named Chris Milk, um, where he had a concept for this, uh, this triptych of installations that interacts with you, and I directed the software for this. So I'll show you a video of him explaining how that works. So it's a triptych where the three individual panels represent the process of creative conception. This is something that I struggle with constantly. So the first panel where your body disintegrates into the birds, that represents that initial moment of conception. It's the moment of inspiration, it's the lightning in a bottle, it's the purest moment of the idea that there is. So this essentially represents birth. Now the second panel is representative of the critical response, either you know, by your own self-doubt, outside critical forces, or just the impossibilities presented through the process of production. This is what it feels like to have your purest expression picked apart by a thousand angry beaks. In other words, this, this panel is death. The third panel, where you sprout the giant wings, represents that feeling when somehow you and the idea are able to transcend that death in the panel before. The idea sort of transforms through the process of abstraction into something that's larger ultimately than its original. So this panel is transfiguration. So can anybody guess what camera we used to make this? <laughs> It was the Kinect. And this is we actually used the Kinect SDK because of its amazing skeleton tracking abilities. And granted, we ran into some trouble because we were pointing at the back of people when it was designed for the front and their, their hair or head would disappear. But all of these you know, aesthetic 
concerns that come up with using these devices, you, you, you solve with design and you solve with um, in-person molding with the data and trying to get it to express something that maybe it wasn't intended to express. And those silhouettes are derived from the deaf map, something that was meant for computers to use, but we can use it to make it feel like someone's shadow is disappearing to tell a story in a space. And along, along these lines as I've been doing this work, something has been boiling up in my mind about, about the means of production of these, of these projects. And, and I've, this curiosity has, has come from being so deeply ingrained in working with this, these, these cameras and this data and this interaction. And so it's boiled into something that I call aesthetic research or critical aesthetics, um, but it doesn't really necessarily have a name, except when you're talking about the specific projects, which I'll show you. But I think it all sort of started, or what set the spark was uh, a science fiction author by the name of Bruce Sterling, which maybe some of you guys have read. And he was giving the closing keynote for the Vimeo Awards, the website Vimeo, um, where they, and he had, was speaking on the vernacular of video. Um, and it was a long rambling talk, if any of you guys have seen him talk. But at one moment, he stumbled upon this gem that really um, clicked with me, where he's talking about the camera of the future. I'm going to play just a clip from that talk to see the, the, next, the, the remainder of my talk. Except it's not a lens. It's just a piece of black fabric or glass. It's an absorptive surface that simply absorbs every photon that touches it from any angle. And then in order to take a pic... Oh. Oh, no. Hmm. I'll try it again. But Except it might have it's not short, a shortened. It's just a piece of black fabric or glass. It's an absorptive surface that simply absorbs every photon that touches it from any angle. And then in order to take a pic... Oh, it's got short. So what he says, and I've memorized the quote, is in order to take a picture, I simply send the problem out to the cloud wirelessly. I compute the photograph after the fact from a computational data set from these cameras that are perceiving the world from every angle for, and in every moment of time, and then I can photograph after the fact. And photography becomes a data visualization problem of sorts. Um, a month after the talk, this camera came out. And you know, there was a lot of buzz around this camera, and especially with its interaction, like how it opened up all these new possibilities for people to interact with computers and speak with computers. But the as the open source drivers became available and people started to pull the images off of this camera and those sort of streamed onto the internet, we saw pictures that looked like this. And this is our friend Kyle. He's a member of the Open Frameworks community and he was involved with uh, 3D scanning research long before the Kinect came out. And so he was, of course, one of the pioneers to be excited about you know, the, the opening of this technology for creative projects. And when I saw this image, Bruce's words were in my mind. This, this surprised me and referenced what he was saying because this photograph was taken from a different angle from where that camera was. And you can immediately start to derive all the, the implications of that based on you know, that his science fiction prediction that more sensors, higher fidelity, higher quality, you can start to think um, of what this new computational photography paradigm that this camera might be nascently ushering in and I wanted to explore that, even in its nascent form. And one of the things that I found the camera needed augmentation for was the, the resolution of the color. I, I felt like it wasn't, the photographic quality of the color camera on board wasn't enough to satisfy my needs of documenting things around. So working with a photographer, Alexander Porter, we strapped uh, an SLR to the top of the camera. And then I wrote software that would capture it, images, depth images, at the same time that he would take a photograph just by signaling at each other and me clicking a wireless mouse. And we took it to the subway because we had just heard a radio story of a, a contract between Lockheed Martin and the MTA where Lockheed Martin had promised a massively advanced surveillance system to be installed in the New York subway system. And the, you know, and as, as happens in product and software design, the, the product team sold it before it existed, and then it never actually worked. And so it resulted in massive lawsuits, and also 
thousands of unused surveillance cameras uh, just living dormant in the New York subway system. And we sort of use this as, a, as an inspirational anecdote to imagine what seeing through that science fiction surveillance system would have looked like. And so we pulled this data together and we started to combine it. And we pulled, the images we were pulling started to look like this. And they felt like this fractured reality of seeing through the eyes of a machine. And it sparked imagination all over the place in people that were seeing it and thinking, you know, thinking about this type of thing, thinking about sen well, what sensing technology means. And as we start to have this greater uh, collaboration with computers or interaction with computers, trying to empathize and trying to understand what it means to be seen and what the limitations are. So we were playing with that aesthetic territory and, and connotating that type of um, concern. But we were also still interested in this idea of re-photography. And in this image set, we would generate pairs where each image was, each pairs of image was the same moment in time, but visualized with different data from different perspectives. Maybe easier to see if the lights were down just a little bit. But um, this is, you know, getting at this notion. But we also realized a very interesting problem in our, na our, in our naivety, that I couldn't just linearly scoot these images on top of one another. I couldn't just take the SLR image and just scoot it onto the depth map and have it line up. That there was actually a greater problem going on. And I, I was really interested in continuing to refine the aesthetics of this, of this process and combining these cameras together. So again, the open source community sort of came to my, um, oh, came to my survival and we, uh, we refined this process. And we built this. So this, the, I have these to, um, to pass around, actually, so you guys can check out. Um, we started talking to, to Kyle, who was pictured earlier, and Elliot Woods, and various members who had um, done a lot of like, stuff that Andy's doing, this calibration, combining different perspectives. And we opened up this whole problem space of how do we take a camera like this and combine it with, um, with this other camera to get at a, at, to continue to excavate this idea of depth cinema. Um, and so we designed these mounts so that we could combine them together. And all these interesting design problems started to come out of this one, this one notion and pe other people started to get involved. Um, and so we eventually, we created uh, the, the RGDB toolkit, which is an open source platform for depth filmmakers to, be, to begin experimenting with this format. And we're also doing this while we're creating our projects. So it's this, it's this shared notion of artists as tool makers and making a open, opening a process to the world as well as exploring it through your, th through your ideas. And I want to pause briefly while you pass those around and play for you the first um, pilot film of the project that we're working on now that I'm, gonna, that I'm ultimately presenting, which is this idea of computational, of artists, um, seeing artists through a computational lens. Um, yeah, and I'll give a little more background on this. Uh, <laughs> this project started at, at the Studio for Creative Inquiry. The, the calibration system was that, that prototyping session was done as an artist in residency program where Golan had invited and the studio had invited many different people from the community to work together in person. And that's where we finally cracked the code on, on combining these cameras together. And so these in-person intense sessions are what create these sort of bursts of creativity and ingenuity. And I was so privileged to be a part of that because it's what led, has led to all this interesting research. I just want to add that was at the Art and Code Conference in October 2011, uh, which was a gathering to enable connect hacking and to teach connect hacking that was supported by Microsoft Research. Yeah, so gratefully indebted. And so my collaborator on the film I'm going to show is also a fellow at the studio, Jonathan Menard. And this is the pilot for the, the interactive documentary that we're producing that I'll explain later. Programming, it's um, you can do whatever you want. 
at, at some point you, you it's, um, I wouldn't say biblical, but it's like there's nothing in the beginning or, or just as you have in history, it's just an empty space and then you can start throwing things in there. Uh, what I want to do, I want to program like I can paint. So like 10 years ago, I, I, I painted a lot and I want to get the same feeling with code. There's so many things that you want to do that you could do by hand and it would take you a long time, but if like programming just increases your capabilities, you know, almost exponentially. I addicted myself and I'm highly addicted to programming. You can't stop me, sometimes I forget to eat. Sometimes I forget to sleep. And I don't know, can you turn a pickle back into a cucumber? Probably not. So I'm here for life. You've, you've got me. It's terminal. This adding and taking away, that's kind of the design process now. It's, I still feel in control, uh, but I like to be surprised. I think that's the beauty of it. Um, the, the thing when the system goes beyond what you naturally understand it to do, and sometimes you have something that surprises you. Uh, and I always look for that, that one moment, basically. You get to a point in large visualizations where it's just actually too much data to look at as a flat image, and you have to do some sort of zooming or you know, flying through navigation to get I don't know, to focus on some small part of it because just it's, I don't know, there's so many examples of this, like a huge hairball of connections and like it means nothing at some point. And he is basically explaining how the database works. And he said that there's one point here and then you go around and then there's another audio sample there and another one there. And because this is closer, this is the one which is matched. <laughs> and it's like, and he explains everything like that. Is there an experience, a digital experience, that you desire to have? Oh yes, teletransportation. Yeah, that's, uh, that's oh, yeah, there are many things. Um, yeah, there are, <laughs> there are many things. But okay, that's something I shouldn't talk about. But yeah, tra teletransportation, it's uh, because, you know, there was a time when they said, well, with video conferences, you, you won't need to meet, and, but they don't work so well. Uh, you still need to to be with the people to really discuss and work on project. You can do part of it by by by, um, by video conferences, but it, it has its limits. So it means I have to travel. I'm sick of traveling. I lose so, so much time in the airport and waiting for trains, and I cannot work. So I wish teletransportation. Is it is it possible? Is it going to be possible? I really I really want that. We, you could start off with, with the point cloud of this and then, I don't know, at some point when I say, uh, talking about water or physical systems, all the points you could just flush or turn into water or something like that, just to illustrate the thing you've been talking about. It's the thing that comes after a video camera. It's the thing that comes after a camcorder. To connect with a digital camera, I guess there's a sound microphone and there's this amazing blinding light. Because this footage is rendered in a 3D environment and you have to look at it from some perspective, you can browse anywhere in it, you can see just edges of it or the camera angle can change even though this camera's been completely static. There's just a lot of room to play. It'll, it's, it's an experimentation, you don't know what will work. There's no cinematic language that has evolved yet, so we're sort of at a point to define that. In theory, you could build the whole universe inside your computer. You just don't have enough power and then you'll never get there and it would be boring to build the same thing all over again. But in theory, you could and that's something I find kind of stunning. So... Um, that film was, uh, the, the protagonists are media artists and programmers, people who consider themselves in this 
confusing hybrid discipline, but powerfully creative discipline of being both implementers and, and creators of systems, but as well as artists and, and you know, uh, cultural questioners. And we continue to build this database of conversations and uh, work, working now in a way to present them interactively. And that's something I'll explain in a second. But um, I'd like to pause and answer a lot of questions that I received yesterday and give a demonstration of actually how this calibration system works, because I think this audience is particularly receptive to, to that explanation. So I'd like to illustrate it. Um, so again, this is the problem space. You have two powerful pieces of commodity hardware, and you want them to work together in a new way. And the problem is that you have two lenses which have different angles. And it's a classic calibration problem where you want to be able to look to understand the relationship between these two lenses so that you can create a mapping between the two different types of data and understand where they live in the world. Um, so the first, the first challenge is to find the lens intrinsics. So we need to know exactly the shape empirically based on known data in the world the field of view, the, the, the principal point, all of the things that you need to know about a lens to model it in code and the distortion coefficients. And we do this for both the, um, the Kinect as well as the, uh, the SLR image or whatever your external camera is. This is one of the things that was really nice about the LibFreeNect is it had, in its first release, it had access to the raw IR image so that we could actually see the checkerboard through the lens of the Kinect and get the intrinsics off of that. Um, which now I hear the, now the Connect SDK support, so we'll be able to support our toolkit on that platform, which is really exciting. Um, and so the second part is a little more tricky, and that's finding the lens extrinsics. And this is a new system that we actually just recently developed that's a different way of, of finding this mapping, so I'll explain it really quickly. So the extrinsic parameters, again, is a translation and rotation between the two lenses, and the way we find this is we collect a small data set of samples after we have the, the intrinsics. So we know roughly what the SLR looks like in its own world and what the, what the Kinect looks like, the depth camera looks like in its own world. And so we collect a series of pairs off the, off the Kinect. And this is actually the color image that's been distorted to match the depth image. Most of the time, you do it the other way around. But because we're really interested in the cinematic quality and the aesthetics of the depth image, we don't want to touch that data. The distortion destroys it visually. So we actually work to pull the RGB pixels so that they match the, the depth image. And this is somewhat non-traditional. This is supported with a hack to LibFreeNect, but actually Connect for Windows supports this all, as well. Um, and so given this, we actually get a really rich data set of checkerboard positions floating in 3D space, which is super powerful. Because you can take their, by inferring the checkerboard, the corners, you can then sample those points in the depth in the depth image, and so you get a known floating data set with the, um, of known points. At the same time, you take co, co you know simultaneous coincident uh, images with the SLR and load those into the into the software, and so then you have the same exact rich data set of 2D, 2D image points. And for people who've done calibration, this is a simple solve PMP where you have object points and image points, and you can find. Uh, extrinsic relationship rotation translation. So this is how we then understand the mapping of those two lenses. Um, and I'll actually demonstrate this working in code. And this is something I hacked together last night. So apologies if it's a little, um, a little rough. But this is, this is part of the RGDB toolkit SDK. So this isn't the toolkit itself but it's code written against this library. So it gives me a few simple things, like a, um, like a timeline that lets me visualize both the depth stream and the, and the color stream together. So this is, a, this is an external video file. This isn't taken from the Kinect. It's an SLR. Um, and I can scrub through this. You know, Finding key phrases in these massive conversations was a huge challenge. We need to have a, a, a visual timeline, like Final Cut or Adobe Premiere based um, editing system, but built into our environments that understand these non-traditional data formats. So this is one of the um, nice things that we've been building into the toolkit. Um, so the first thing I'll do is just show the depth projection matrix. So this is a, the classic, this is the, the intrinsic parameters of the Kinect visualized. 
and it's you know, a, a classic pyramid, 640 by 480. Inside of that, we can render or project our points and draw a wireframe of our subject. Um, she's thinking critically. She might even be thinking about whether she wants to teleport right now, I think. And we can play this back. They say, well, with video conferences, we, we won't need to meet. And, but they don't work so well. Uh, you still need to, to be with the people to really discuss and work on project. You can do part of it by, 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 um, by video conferences. But so now we have a big part of our data, which is you know, a, a really nicely uh, surface reconstruction. We can do some hole filling here, which we have stuff for. But we have our form, and, it, and we have it mapped to this video. But now we need to actually combine our known extrinsics, and we do that using projective texturing. So um, here's a visualization of the RGB camera in relationship to the Kinect. And this is pretty good, right? There's our Kinect. There's our SLR. You can kind of imagine the lens is floating a little bit out in front. So that's about, that looks about right. If you look at where they land on the figure, it's about right. So then if we actually visualize our texture being projected here, you can see it coming off of this frustum. And then we can just project that onto our form. And now we have it has its a limits. richly textured So it means uh, I have SLR. to travel. I'm sick of traveling. I lose so, I waste so much time in planes and in airport and waiting for trains and I cannot work. So I wish teletransportation. Is it, is it possible? Is it going to be possible one day? I really, I really want that. And so you start to see the, the camera language here. Like I, I have interactive control over viewing this person talk and I want to punch in at certain points. I'm curious about which angle looks more interesting. I pull off axis to see the profile or look for someone in the eye even if they looked away from the camera. And this type of interaction has become extremely fascinating and we really feel like we're excavating a new type of cinematic language. Um, so I hope that was el elucidating. So that was a software demo. Didn't go so bad. <laughs> so, and actually, I'll stop there if anybody has any questions about that technical stuff, because I'm going to get back into the conceptual project. So, so why, why are you going back to the, the um, I'm debating about whether I should just ask it this offline. <laughs> I do have a couple of questions about your calibration procedure. OK. Um, do, you, do you want to, we can yeah, talk about that. OK, OK. Um, for everybody else. We, we, we last, yesterday we were things. joking about, starting a Calibrators Anonymous. It's like a drinking club, but people are like, where's your fudge factor? I was like, oh, I totally hit it. There was like, I, I hard coded it before the demo, but it, I definitely had a fudge factor. So yeah, there's always, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a voodoo. It feels like it's close to like electronics programming as I've ever gotten writing software. Just like never is right. But, um, but yeah, I'd love to discuss more about how it works. And I feel like people in this room probably are like, you don't have to, that's not way too complicated. So. Um, but now I want to talk to you, continue to talk about clouds, which is where we're taking this, this project. And I, I want to really introduce this idea of an infinite conversation. And this network that we visualized here is an abstraction of this idea, where uh, each one of these dots is a snippet, kind of like was in the last video that you saw. And we have 30 hours of these snippets, even after it's been condensed to things that are potentially interesting to a lot of different audiences who would have intersection with this world of art and code together. And we're, we're finding ways of networking them, of saying, well, at this point in the conversation, they bring up this subject. And at that point, there's all these digressions that could work as follow-ups. In the same way when you're having a conversation with someone and you're excited, you have a million things you want to say. And afterwards, you realize, I only said a f small portion of it. Well, hopefully, this system, this generative system, will present a way to explore a conversation where you can exhaust those possibilities um, or feel like they're never exhaustible. So this uh, traversal, this, it's sort of hard to see here, is the idea of one path through this, where you fall, go, jump from node to node, maybe starting with a search query, saying, I'm really interested in how online sharing affects creativity, or I'm interested in um, the dangers of perpetual novelty. These sort of, and, and then the system constructs a story for you, and you're at will to follow. You, know, you can watch it, or you can take digressions. Um, so, and at the moment, and this is where it gets uh, pitchy, as we have a Kickstarter campaign that we launched maybe 48 hours ago um, to help fund this, this project. And 
you know, I appeal to you on a personal level. If you think it's interesting, we would love your support. And uh, you know, there's some cool, cool rewards that we have that I'll show you. Um, but I want to show to you, for, to further illustrate the concept, uh, and to show you where the, the next generation of this, um, this research has gone, I want to show you the video from that, from that Kickstarter. So we could really interesting. hit the lights. The idea that uh, you know, when I talk a lot about the, the fact that our lives can be documented through, through data, and they are being documented through data. I just think it's so much fun to build projects that people can bring their own stories to and their own perspective. A real passion for code and impulse to share their inventions unites this community of open source programmers who are the 21st century's pioneers of digital art. So you may be wondering what's up with the way this video looks. Well, it's filmed using a format we've been experimenting with called RGBD. It's video, but with another dimension, and it offers new potential for filmmaking. This is the first production of its kind, a film exploring creative technology while using an emerging technology. So Microsoft Sorry released the a video right, game guys. controller called the Xbox Kinect, and immediately, artists and designers recognized its potential as a 3D scanner. The community worked together to make it available for creative projects. We are both filmmakers who work with technology, and we wanted to use this device to make movies. Clouds will be the first production to use this technique. So as we've been developing the film, we've been releasing our code open source, teaching workshops so that others can get involved. Recently, we've begun to see some amazing projects come out of this. So these are all projects that other people made with our open source software in the last few months. It's almost like people across the planet are dreaming together. There's this imagination that's coming about by people interacting with one another and creating this totally different thought space. We have over 20 hours of edited conversations captured in RGBD. And we want to give you access to all of it, but in a way that can be explored interactively, like experiencing a documentary in a video game environment. I'm interested in the, in the underlying aesthetic of the data. I'm interested in how networks manifest themselves at kind of multi-scaled levels. Uh, I'm interested in emergent properties. I'm interested in our brain's ability to, to recognize pattern. I'm interested in those are the, those are the, those are the Write down, write down, write down, write down action. How do you like break down the passing of time and what the self means? I think you could just like disappear and reappear at every instance. In this phase of the project, we're building an application to present the interviews as an infinite conversation. We imagine this working in real time, allowing the viewer to control the camera, flying through space, choosing what conceptual threads to follow or who to watch. So I'll pause it there. Because after that, we just beg. Please. <laughs> so, um, really in oh. so this is, again, this visualization of this conversation where we want to present these interviews in this completely navigable world. And we, we know it we can do it, and we just need the time and space and um, ex, you know, platform to show it. So we plan on distributing this on a Mac and Windows application on these customized USB drives that we're having laser etched. So there's also an art collector sort of attitude to it or a uh, collectible object that will, these little capsules will contain this precious data. You can also download it, but um, something that we're excited about. These new, new ideas of transmedia storytelling and film distribution in, with new media. Um, and yeah, so that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, really interesting work. Uh, I have a couple of questions, actually. The first one is, 
One of the most interesting aspects of this RGBD video are actually completely novel ways of thinking about transitions that I see mm -hmm. in your, your work. You're basically, the actual shots of, of people in there, um, they have a certain novelty factor right now. I don't know exactly how well, you know, given that, given this kind of a quality that you have right now, to mm -hmm. like we can improve on that. But one thing that's really fascinating is that you can introduce a completely new language of transitions. So far totally. we had crossfades and you know, kind of yeah. silly things, but you're introducing all sorts of dissolves, particles, particles and all this stuff. Um, people can also be co-located in the same right, right, exactly. particle can, space together. You right. can merge particles from one person to the other. <clears throat> yeah, also definitely. Yeah. So my question is, what kind of tools and what, what, it, what are you actually building to actually support this stuff? Because one of the things is, the pipeline that you're showing is really, you know, processing the, the existing software and things like that. But transitions are purely animation. It's right. stuff that you haven't recorded. Right. It's it's kind of a, a, animation scripting and mm -hmm. things like that. So there's a completely separate part to this that I'm missing in your presentation. Yeah, I think it's because it's still the part that's nascent and to be explored. Like when we do these transitions, again, I like we we work in two modes. We have this toolkit, this this user facing application that's sure. essentially a hack turned GUI turned public turned stuck with it. You know, there's no release cycle system in place. We're just like publishing this stuff, and. Uh, that's, you know, that's actually sort of a condemning middle ground because you, it, you know, you're stuck with the default aesthetics that have been programmed into that interface. So we're the, with the Kickstarter in the next round and what we've learned from the community is we're taking it two ways. The first way um, is building a more robust API so people who are programmers can actually you know, get, at the, get at the VBO structure, get at the projective texturing shader, really document how those work so that people that are working at a high level can start to script these things and make their own things. Uh, grant, granted, that'll be a smaller subset of people. And for actually disseminating this into culture and seeing really unique things, we're working on data format. So we've already done a little bit of this. Actually, when you saw the, the thing with uh, Aaron Koblen, he was like a triangulated form and he was drawing in space. That was done in Cinema 4D. And we exported a bunch of data as OBJ files and sequences. And actually, with Maya, we've been able to bake the texture, the projective texturing into the OBJ file, and then export a series of an image sequence along with an OBJ sequence. So actually, our process is just becomes a data capture and preprocessor system to let people who, you know, filmmakers and animators that are more expressive in these environments really make this stuff come to life. And that's going to be the next. I, the next year is going to be full of that. As soon as we release these tools, there's so many people chomping at the bit to get access to this data in their you know, native, native habitat, basically. So that's where I think we'll see more of these interesting transitions. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree that it's just the transitions that are interesting. No, I no, think, no, no, no. yeah. I was saying it's one of the things that you know. haven't spent yeah. much time talking about. Right. I, I agree the other stuff is interesting as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm wondering, are you thinking of doing the opposite? So like right now, you're saying the you're, you're trying to export as much of the data and put them into tools that people are using. But those are not technically cinematography tools. They're mostly modeling and animation tools, right. like you're mentioning, which is interesting. So the opposite approach might be that you actually have a pre-script animation sequences, like transitions right, right now in movie editing tools, that are applicable to RGBD right. that you can apply. So you can have a cross dissolve that's a point cloud cross dissolve that you just apply to your movie sequence, in which case you don't have to go and and invest time to do the. It seems like it, there's right. also an opportunity there, not not to learn Maya and spend right. you know a year getting getting good about it, but actually just focus on editing movies in, mm -hmm. a, in this new media. Right. I think you know like the what we've really learned is that you have to play ball with the ecosystem that exists. And I kind of had this bullheaded attitude of like I'm going to make my own final cut for depth data, and we got pretty far, but making that timeline system was insanely complicated, and I felt like I was losing my like sharpness as like making art projects because I spent you know three months building this timeline system and granted that also has community benefits and we've been using it in the film it has interactive implications um, so I think as far as the research strain of publishing this idea and pioneering the thought space of RGBD as a, as a film format making it available for um, creative uses in existing 3D applications is going to be really where the interesting work happens James, your your three months spent developing the the RGBD timeline editor was made possible at a residency in right. Japan, right? Right. At 
the Yamaguchi Center for Art and Media. It was actually specifically the timeline. Yeah, I spent three months in Japan this summer at a, an arts organization as a technician, so it's actually the opposite. Um, and but they have a it's contractual a contractual agreement that everything you produce there will be published open source, given credit to the um, to the organization. In fact, I wasn't allowed to push code to anybody's GitHub but theirs, but it had to be public. So it was really interesting restriction because they're interested in building credibility within the open source community as an arts organization that funds tools. Um, and so I spent three months there, kind of in like as a like Buddhist programmer in South Japan, eating sushi and, and doing really delicate GUI code, um, which was, yeah, and I did a few little art projects too, but um, so that's, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I do agree with you that this transition idea is one of the most you know, interesting uh, aspects of it. Can you speak a little bit more on the interactive aspects of what you're talking about? Just because I think I got a little confused because we're talking sure. what's currently here, what we like, and stuff like that. Right, right. So right. the film, the Kickstarter, that's for finishing up this playback linear sequence with the effects being generated this way, right? No, this, the, the Kickstarter is for the inter production of the interactive documentary. Okay, so where I'd be able to self move the camera, the mm -hmm. tractors, pulsers, audio feeding in and out based on what I'm getting close to exactly. the particle effects as I move. Yeah, that's something that we're, you know, we're considering. I think the camera control will be work within a constraint. Like it's kind of like these WebGL sort of systems where you're still you're influencing the direction, but there's through narrative tension. But then you still feel like you're you have autonomy with head movement. Um, but I think the most interesting interaction comes from how it influences the story engine that you're able to steer it on a trajectory so it continues to be interesting. Um, so that's more of like at each moment these digressions will be presented to you in the world that the people exist in. And again, these transitions, when you make a transition, there's a spatial metaphor that happens where you actually feel the camera moving through from that node to the next node and drawing the conceptual relationship mapped into space. So <clears throat> one of the things that sounds uh, interesting about these uh, projects is that the Kinect data that you're showing and people see it as new because the data looks kind of weird. In yeah. A way. So, do you think that if there, if instead of having connect data that is pretty bad in general, yeah. if you had perfect reconstruction, maybe people would not be as interested. I think if we had perfect reconstruction, it'd be so new that it would be way more mind blowing. <laughs> but I here's my response to that is really interesting. I've, I've thought about this a lot because in the way it's we we have this term embrace the glitch. Um, which means like we're kind of actually celebrating the the nascent aesthetic of this and but then you added the SLR. Right. So, so I, <clears throat> but then we also embrace about this too. It's like it feels like you're it's embrace the fudge. You have a you have a you're <laughs> working on you're working out the aesthetics of the RGBD camera, but then you did this other thing where you added this SLR where it's now like perfect video. So right. I wonder if you could comment about that. Because it feels like you you went back on we hedged. Well, yeah, you embrace the glitch, but you don't want to look bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, at every, at every moment, you're making in-person aesthetic judgments about it, about it. And I think um, the... the you deal with the faults of the medium, right. but you also try to make it bend to your will and look good. Yeah. Well, I think maybe it, I, would, I was expecting a slightly different answer, something more like, well, it has to be at least as, as, as far as the old media is concerned, like just straight up 2D video, it has to at least look, it look, look like that. Yeah, defi right? that's definitely a good so answer. So you can at least yeah. sort of, like, you know, people don't walk away thinking this is crap. So, so we're playing in this dangerous territory of, of, of aesthetic novelty. And even in our own research, we look back at what we made three months ago and we go, oh, that's terrible. Yet remembering when we had that breakthrough, we're like, this is amazing. So we're constantly like uh, exhausting ourselves with this because it's this research and aesthetic novelty. And I think what's important to realize and, and, and how to sort of be safe in that territory is frame your work in the fact that you're documenting right now. And so this, these conversations happened in the course of a year. At this, at this pivotal juncture of this explosion of the art and technology scene, a lot of it having to do with the, the public publicity that came out of their role in the Connect hacking movement, which is something that's become a household, almost a household known movement, which has brought exposure to this community. So documenting these people in this format right now, hearing them talk uh, at this, at their age and in, at the, this community, it's, you're, you're making a, a document of the moment. And so 
we're hoping, and the, the, the conceptual answer to this um, is that when we look back on this, it will feel like a home movie. It'll feel, it'll have, it'll be like a Super 8 film where you love the, the inherent um, imperfections of the media because it was so appropriate for that time and it really captures that time. So rather than trying to make really slick motion graphics, something that's um, you know, only successful because of its aesthetic perfection, we're instead saying this is the medium of this time and let's, let's capture the voice of right now in that medium and that will give it a timelessness. Time to create the future Instagram that takes the uh, 50 year from now and makes it look like the RGB. Yeah, I, there's totally going to be a, so on your cell phone in the in you know 20 years there'll be a Connect style filter which takes your depth data, tatters up the edges, puts in artifacts, it puts a few holes in people's glasses, you know, and yeah, exactly. So yeah. What are your thoughts about getting more views? Um, we've tried it. I, I, the one aesthetic problem with that is the joints. And it, I've been able to fuse the joints, like doing really, it's really computationally intensive. So it quickly makes me think that I should learn PCL and then I go, oh, I'm just going to go, like, <laughs> like I, you know, I'm not, like, there's still an arti artist side of me, which, like, is a fearfully inept computer programmer that I, like, hide my code from people sometimes. But, so, there's a computational problem with that that I haven't been able to really overcome, but also aesthetically, those joints I've never been happy with because as you get further away from the camera, you get these, the, the, the data's like nature changes, and when you fuse those, I haven't gotten it to look good. And so, and also, the way we're doing these shoots, it's so, like setting up is so instantaneous and kind of on the go that we really can barely handle the data flow of having two cameras, let alone trying to figure out a situation of having more. I think, I definitely, definitely, yeah, I've, are, we've already been, I've done a few experiments that I haven't published because they didn't look nice, but it's a direction that I want to go. Like it's, it's, like I imagine Bruce Sterling's vision where you actually just have this full reconstruction and you can just choose these camera angles and every camera angle looks like a photograph. And that's, that's fascinating to me. When, granted, when it gets that perfect, it won't be interesting anymore, but um, that's this, like, this is asymptote that we're working towards. So it definitely involves more sensors. Have you thought about um, distribution? It seems uh, in this age of everything has to be online and everything that has to be on YouTube, uh, the, pro the big problem is this, these, these are super data intensive and I, I admire your way of distributing them on USB sticks. I think that's a, in some sense it's kind of a little bit retro right now, but it, it's, completely, <laughs> it's completely necessary because there's no real good ways of distributing them. So have you thought about like, Dissemination beyond kind of the yeah. Let me. I want to show you a demo that we we collaborated with um, a WebGL programmer, and we actually came up with a really hacked little format to to slip an RGB a D stream into a WebM video, and we made a um, a zoetrope out of our friend. Let me find this really quick. So there are you know early steps in, in showing RGB video in a browser. Yeah, and, I mean, I mean, ideally, in, in theory, in, in principle, it would be great if the cloud's generative documentary could be in the browser. That'd be great. I think, There's yeah. A lot of data to push. Um, it's it, it's the fact that like you know our the WebGL is still nascent enough that it um, it freaks me out if we're gonna like actually go forward and be like, hey, everybody, we're fund this documentary that we're gonna publish in WebGL. Whereas like we have the tools and we have the know-how to make it work as a as a rich you know desktop application. So um, I think we will do a follow-up project to this, to this film, and it will have a website, and I imagine mixing video content with some WebGL snippets. Um, but that would be an ideal format for distribution. So one of the reasons why you would do it in WebGL is because you want to make it interactive in some sense. And you want to distribute the three-dimensional thing easily through the internet. You want to... Again, it doesn't matter so if it's three unless you're changing your viewpoint. Yeah, exactly, right. exactly. So it's then, interactive, yeah. But then, like, so, so now you're... There's this line you're crossing between sort of like the what the what your um, director um, wants, the creative director on this on this this um, sequence, and what the user wants to do. And I was wondering how you right. thought about like this is the debate we we're having actually with some some kind of related project where we don't know like there's there's some effort to say oh well let's just render the thing to a regular movie you know a regular sequence and slap it on YouTube be done with it. Right. 
but then you know, to totally, totally taking away the, the interactive component. Um, and then the question is, well, as a creative director, you might not want any interaction. So, right. for clouds in particular, what do you envision? What is the user going to be doing? I mean, think, I think the, the important thing is like, as a creative director, you're an interaction designer, and you you present a system that's constrained but has freedom within it, and so that the person feels like they're completing the system by being inside of it. So what that means is like, as it's an intuitive interaction, so moving the mouse um, will cause the camera to, to move in an intuitive way uh, to like highlight different things so that people can sort of investigate this curiosity. Or just even the minor parallax of, of a shifting camera gives you this feeling of fluidity and openness. And so that, that kind of um, interaction that's constrained that you can still move your head makes you feel like you're in a world. So do you think that um, in cloud you're going to have like moments where the camera is completely not under the user's control and then other moments where there, it is under the user's control? Definitely. Like back and forth. And how do yeah. I mean it's like a cut sequence in a video game too. Like video game has a lot of developed lang you know, language for this. Like visual cues that show that you're passing you're taking control away from the user and showing them this richer experience versus like now they're. Some of them is funny and right is the letterbox effect, right? The right. Letterbox. Effect. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and these like is cinematic that, cues. Is that weird? Yeah. It's now a movie. So it's this is so this is Aaron Koblen in WebGL, and he has all these little snippets of his interview. My first experimentation with collaboration online was a project called the Sheet Market. It's basically using Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which is like the eBay for brains. And you you can pay people and you can get them to do tasks online. So for the project, I, I thought hey, I'll pay people two cents and I'll get them to do this ridiculous activity. I'll say, draw a sheep facing to the left and I'll pay you your two cents. And I started collecting thousands and thousands of hands. This is interactive, yeah, I can click, them. yeah, I can go to these different guys. definitely about different things now. And they're all just, just different little outtakes, basically. So the second project that I worked on, with, that's definitely one of the attributes of storytelling. And so this has a very slight so camera shifting across sort of planet. perspective. And we're able to communicate so, uh, across cultural bounds. If you already have this, it's, it's a nominal step getting this to a Surface app that shoots out HDMI 3D to your $600 optical projector, right? The 3D active shutter projector. That you, you mean have. like stereo 3D? Yeah, yeah. Because you have all the data. And yeah. If you have this, is this up? Just do it. That's fine. I'd love to see it. If I can grab this, it's yes. Because URLs right there. <laughs> because we're talking about two different ends of the spectrum. Some questions right. are well, you have a creative director who has a linear flow for the documentary style, the linear flow, and then you're talking. Fully interactive. Right, right. But, which is totally but like we, a we both yeah. we're, we're talking, but we're, mis we're making an assumption on standard 2D projection technologies. When 3D projection technologies are are all over the place, right? Now, right? At, at a very right. and then dropping in price point. So I haven't seen it yet. I'd love to see it, and many people have brought it up. If we talk at three, I could be happy to yeah, do some stuff. I would love. I because these these figures would really pop in Absolutely. stereo. They would just. And the data's yeah. all there, Greg yeah. seven already supports it. We just can't yeah. have them shake hands. In fact, that. this open this open frameworks, uh, DirectX, so maybe the, the Connect for Windows RGBD toolkits release will have DirectX supported 3D, which could be amazing. Yeah, it's something that it's like there's I feel like I need ten of me and I I think my it's about opening my process more. I'm trying to be as open as possible, but it's still like people want to get involved and I don't have the bandwidth to like do a knowledge transfer to them through email, and then they're busy to get you know this community. I feel like the community's there and they're boiling, and I just like every morning I get up and answer two or three RGBD emails about people that are trying to get involved or having problems with it, and so it's just a matter of finding you know it takes time to build that knowledge base and do these new experiments. But there's a there's a whole log of things that we want to try. If we do talk later, I'd it'd be awesome to some see some office I have stuff. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, it'd be great. Cool. Any other questions? I don't know how I'm doing on time. A little bit over. We should probably peel out of here at 11.50 or so. OK. Any questions? Yeah, lunch. Well, thank you. OK, yeah, thanks, everybody.